competition from urban literature and American industry in China to Edward Said Memorial Lecture of 2018. It has become a tradition of AOC to celebrate the life and legacy of Edward Said on or around his birthday, which falls on November, on the 1st of November. We have started the series of memorial lectures many years ago. Distinguished professors have contributed to delivering this special lecture to honor the memory of Edward Said. This list includes in chronological order since the year 2005. I just mentioned the names. You probably recognize all these names. David Damroche, Cornel West, Terry Eagleton, Rokas Lukut, Judith Butler, John Carlos Rowe, Michael Wood, Sari Magnussi, Marina Warner, Lila Abolo, Suleiman Yen, and Usama Mahesh. This year, distinguished guest is Robert John, who many of you know of through reading his works. Professor Young studied at Oxford University and also taught in it as professor of English and critical theory. In 2005, he moved to New York University as Professor of English and Comparative Literature. He has been serving as Dean of Arts and Humanities at NYU of the Dublin during 2015-2018. Professor Young has been the editor of influential journals, including Oxford Literary Review and Interventions in the National Journal of Postcolonial Studies. He is a fellow of the British Academy and a prolific author whose works have been translated to more than 20 languages, including Arabic. Professor Young is one of the architects of the postcolonial field and theory. His works relevant to postcolonialism include, and I'm going to mention them. White Mythologies, Writing History of the West, 1990, in which he addressed the work of Edward Said. This book has been translated to Arabic. Colonial Desire, 1995. Torn Hearts, Political Conflict in Literary and Cultural Theory, 1996. Postcolonialism, a Historical Introduction, 2001. Postcolonialism, a very short introduction, 2003. The idea of English ethnicity, 2008. Empire, colony, postcolony, 2015. Professor Young has also edited books on post-structuralism in the 1980s, including Untying the Text, a post-structural reader, and Post-structuralism and the Question of History. More recently, he has co-edited and published manuscript of Franz Fanon in literature, psychoanalysis, and politics, under the title of Franz Fanon, a thief sur la vie nation et la liberté, in 2015. This book has been translated to English in 2018, both available at AUC Library. Professor Young will be talking about Fanon, the dramatist, and the newly discovered and published plays of his tomorrow at 1 o'clock in the new Cairo campus of AUC. Today's lecture by Professor Young is on Edward Said's late style and Palestinian aesthetics. Let us welcome Professor Young. I'd like to thank the American 
So as we, as we all know, um, Edward Said was, was really such a very remarkable person in, in so many different ways. And certainly, all of us who work in the post colonial field uh, uh, um, owe so much to him. And it's a uh, his work remains, I think, continuously invented and created for us uh, in the present. But despite its um, institutional success in post colonial studies uh, in universities across the world, and particularly its very important impact, which uh, to be underestimated across the humanities and the social sciences, but of course, no discipline uh, now has been in some sense in the post colonial days, whether it's uh, <coughs> medieval studies, classics, law, uh, religion, theology. Um, so the, the impact of the, of the field has been, has been extraordinary. Uh, but despite that, um, what's uh, interesting and significant, I think, is that uh, <coughs> the field itself. Relatively little uh, with respect to, to the problem that is central to the life of the world of Said. A problem uh, which, of course, is in so many interrelated ways into which emerge in uh, creation, and that is uh, <coughs> the lasting legacy of that colonialism in the years of the British Civil War. Other than Said, what's significant? that actually the first colonial field in Mushroom, so exponential after the of the British Civil War, is in 1978. Um, <coughs> but it's actually kept pretty quiet for that entire span. Uh, uh, um, first colonial studies has, has, has taken science arguments elsewhere, I say, um, uh, particularly to India, uh, of course, uh, and we could argue that in some sense, uh, or at least in some sense, Hijacked uh, for their own agenda. <coughs> so, um, uh, and in doing that, they really disavow or ignore the, the, the whole point of uh, uh, science critique in, in Orientalism. So, tonight I want to uh, return not, not just to uh, Saeed, uh, but to what meant most of him in his esteem. Although he was undoubtedly the founding figure. Uh, and was regarded as such. Uh, it's very interesting that Said himself actually didn't really like post colonial studies. Um, he, he always uh, distrusted the idea of the post colonial. Uh, on the grounds, he said, that it was too early. Because while the vast majority of countries in the world are now historically post colonial, uh, there are others, particularly in Palestine, that haven't yet really acceded to that state. And if Said himself distrusted West colonial theory, it wasn't just because he thought it was too psychoanalytical, too postmodern, too full of jargon, and he put all those things. Um, but above all, because it was premature, uh, or to put it the other way around, because Palestine itself uh, was or is an anachronism that condemned uh, him, in some sense, to uh, be an untimely man, you could say, to live in. In this belated anterior time of the colonial. And in 1997, when asked a question about post colonial studies in an interview, he responded very simply and interestingly, I think, I quote, I'd rather not talk my I'd rather not myself talk about it because I don't think I belong to that. Uh, and so he very clearly distinguished himself that that was not really part of the problem. Because the post colonial was precisely what he, like every, every other Palestinian, aspired to, uh, but something which seemed to remain permanently out of his control. This led him to think about <coughs> Palestine and Palestinians as working in an anachronistic time frame. They were, in some sense, late or belated, <coughs> still caught up in the dynamics of what the majority of peoples in the world was an earlier age of colonial resistance. Well, far from being innovators, he argued back in 1986, we are latecomers, a people in the late 20th century trying to gain the right of self determination that everybody else already has. 
that belated anachronistic situation of not having achieved the state of personal reality and the intractable situation of working <coughs> with the still unresolved issues from 1948, 1967, 1993, 1995, I want to argue <coughs> involves lateness in precisely uh, a comparable way uh, to something that describes a very different uh, context in his marvelous uh, posthumous work, Lady Style. Although he planned Lady Style as a book, <coughs> Side was never to complete the book. In 2003, after he finished his, what was his last book, Humanism and Democratic Criticism, he told his friends that he was now going to finish his, his idea that he <clears throat> had for some time late style. Uh, but before he could do so, he passed away. And the book appeared posthumously, uh, edited in fact by Michael Wood, uh, who's one of his earlier lectures. Given its incompletion, I want to suggest that there's an unstated project hidden in that book that can be drawn out by connecting its thesis to other essays and other remarks that Said made elsewhere. I'm not trying to complete the book for Saeed, because actually, apart from anything else, unfinishedness is itself paradoxically perhaps the quality of, of late start. So it's sort of sadly fitting that he didn't finish the book on late start, because actually it's about not finishing things. Um, but it, I think, gives me, allows me a certain legitimacy in, in adding to it or, or reconceiving it insofar as it's something. Being open, being unfinished, can always live on in, in, in that way. I want to try to articulate something <coughs> that in the book's present form remains only implicit. And if you you could call it the book's unsaid, perhaps if you were thinking back to Pierre Nachere many years ago. And that is that <coughs> Said's investment in the concept of late style involves an aesthetic uh, <coughs> whose unfinishedness correlates precisely to the continuing Palestinian struggle uh, <coughs> as anachronistic, late in relation to the majority of anti-government struggles in the 20th century. In late style, in short, I want to argue that, uh, <coughs> although he doesn't say so explicitly, but what he actually does is offer us what we could call a Palestinian aesthetic, specifically a Palestinian aesthetic. Now, ostensibly, <coughs> Late Style, which I'm sure many of you know, uh, as a book has very little to do with Palestine, so you might think I'm crazy uh, making the suggestion. Um, <coughs> it's got very little to do with Palestine and Palestinian politics because actually it's about music. Uh, uh, <coughs> for most part, it's about Western music and its performance. Um, Said had spoken, uh, actually, including uh, apparently uh, in the book a chapter. On the poetry of Mahmoud Darwish. Uh, there they are. Uh, but in fact, uh, when uh, Michael Wood looked at his papers after his death, no manuscript was found. Whatever he was going to say was still in his head. The accounts of lateness that Saeed gives so, in that book, however, so brilliantly moved between a whole series of different registers, beginning with a certain kind of aesthetics of music. Which is drawn first from Gabriel Adornos, best known speech team in the music of late Beethoven. So it's an entirely musical uh, concept. But it's extended, of course, in late style by Sain into, and this comes across quite strongly in the book in, in, in later essays, uh, into a personal sense of his own life, being towards the end, being late for Sain, too, for leukemia, uh, in Livinus, or Gilroy. So the latitude that that unfinishedness uh, allows, I want, I want to uh, push a bit in this, in this possibility. What's so energizing about the book is that Sani offers a very different uh, theory of literary and cultural responses to those conditions from which, <coughs> from those that we uh, <coughs> conventionally encounter in relation to talking about Palestinian culture. While it seems at first that he's deliberately only focusing on Late works, as you'd expect, late style, late works. Um, 
in the sense of the last works of composers or sometimes writers. In the course of the Said develops a different or more complex thesis, I think, uh, namely that late style is not only what people do late, <laughs> towards the end of their life, um, but that actually <laughs> it involves a certain kind, a certain kind or mode of creativity. And it's <coughs> here that he draws directly on Adorno, who begins his essay on the late style of, of Beethoven in the following very remarkable way. The maturity of the late works of significant artists doesn't resemble the kind one finds in fruit. They are, for the most part, <coughs> not round, but furrowed, even ravaged. Devoid of sweetness, bitter and spiny, they do not surrender themselves to mere adaptation. They lack all the harmony that the classicist aesthetic is in the habit of demanding from works of art. And they show more traces of history than works. So late works aren't round, but they're furrowed, wrinkled. Instead of a blooming perfection, they're fissured and ravaged. And in other essays and fragments, Adorno modifies the sweeping claim with which he begins the late works of significant artists into a dialectical possibility that there can be late works without late style, for Beethoven, but there can also be earlier works that show characteristics of later style. The antithesis, we might say, recuperates the classical, and, uh, classical dialectic of the sublime and the beautiful, or the artist's late works. And true to that dialectical possibility, lateness can take alternate and better forms. On the one hand, both the late works that move to a vision of harmonious and benign view of the world. Uh, <coughs> these are science examples, late Shakespeare, the last plays of Shakespeare, late Matisse, Torres, late string quartet, Schubert's last three piano sonatas, the kind of art articulated by Frank Kermode in his book, 1967, The Sense of an Ending. It was that book that actually led Said to write his book, Beginnings, this is the answer to Kermode. So, so Said's first book was actually Giddings' last book, which is not his first book, second, but his last book about endings. On the other hand, there are also these other late works uh, that come across in the complete opposite way as tough going, resistant, unfinished, deliberately working against the grain of the consensus of their own times. The composer or the writer does this through developing an idiosyncratic style of fragmentariness through anachronism, through an unreadable mix uh, of the difficult and the conventional, putting those two together, refusing to try to reconcile irreconcilable oppositions. Artistic lateness, says Said, involves a quote, intransigence, difficulty, and unresolved contradiction. But curiously, uh, <coughs> Said mentions him only in passing, uh, it makes me think of the late words of Yeats when he's describing it. Late Gates is, is difficult, it's intrinsic, it's a very good example of it, just to give you a single example of, of, of late style. Such, uh, <coughs> such belatedness produces this, what Said calls the deliberately unproductive productiveness, full of these uh, self-contradictory concepts, of going against. Lateness is a kind of self-imposed exile from what is generally acceptable, coming after it and surviving beyond it. So, late style, the book as well as the concept, uh, begins from the aesthetic. And following it all, though, Said uh, himself starts with late Beethoven and then, uh, as you may recall, pushes at uh, Beethoven's relation to Schoenberg. The whole idea is that late Beethoven, Beethoven <coughs> was basically nobody can understand late Beethoven until Schoenberg, and that actually modern music is a version of late <clears throat> pulling it down to people. Uh, uh, and then uh, following with that, there's the discussions of Mozart, Strauss, uh, Benjamin Britten, Glenn Gould, Cavafy, Freud. And it becomes clear as he moves through these different these different artists that Tide isn't discussing just Love's works, but as I was suggesting before, that he's focusing on a particular kind of intellectual, doing a particular kind of creative work. Uh, 
typified by but not confined to late works as such. Now, none of this uh, obviously relates to anything that's um, uh, and it's, it's totally Eurocentric, of course, uh, as well, uh, until uh, we come to the chapter uh, on Jean Genet, which is actually written quite a bit earlier, in fact, in Possibility really first hit me uh, that late style could be read as a um, theoretical exposition of a particular aesthetic form, maybe that has something to do with Palestine, Palestinian writing. The, uh, <coughs> a form that, that I want to argue distinguishes it uh, in, in, in terms of uh, particular aesthetic in relation to other, not only <coughs> Western, but also. Genet Said, Said argues, is the best chronicler of the Middle Eastern landscape. This was back in 1993, 1995, sorry. And it's in North Africa and um, <clears throat> the Middle East that Genet famously, the former thief, prostitute, prisoner, outsider, uh, finds himself most at home, identified with a series of outcasts and revolutionaries uh, <coughs> with uh, Fanon. Uh, and the FLN, with the American Black Panthers, and then latterly with the Palestinian Fedayeen, uh, who Genet saw as, in some sense, carrying on the Algerian struggle. He, he lived with the Fedayeen for some time. And it's that connection that Genet makes with, with Algeria uh, that uh, allows Said to tr trace a direct gene genealogy from Genet in Constantinople. Quote, his unquestioned solidarity was with the very same oppressed uh, identified so passionately analyzed by Fanon. And Said points to what he calls uh, the nomadic energies, with great uncharacteristic, uncharacteristically Deleuzean that <laughs> um, Said. book about uh, his years with the Fedayeen, Fatif Amoro, which uh, was rather it's rather unsatisfactorily translated into English, uh, certainly as the prison of love, but of course uh, it also implies an amorous captive. Uh, it's, it's both of these uh, active and passive. And uh, Sa so Said points to this book as, as an example of late style, fragmented, difficult, uncompromising, intransigent, hard to read, which it is, uh, and, and also to translate. Constantly juxtaposing and highlighting irreconcilable entities. So it's with the chapter on Jinni, uh, who of course is a Palestinian, who's working with Palestinians, uh, that for the first time I think Said starts to explicitly identify the unreconciled aesthetic of late star with the Palestinian struggle. Now, unlike uh, so many accounts of post-colonial literature which uh, emphasize content over everything, namely critiques of, of uh, <coughs> certainly criticism of post-colonial literature is, is, is very content-driven. It's all about just the representation of different particular cultures and histories and so forth. Um, Said's characterization of the, the formal tensions of late style, uh, which he called uh, a kind of self-imposed exile generally acceptable, is a much more provocative, I think, as a description of the literature that challenges, uh, tears acceptability apart, rests in complete, full of sudden discontinuities, presenting the reader not with predictable comfort stations of recognition, which in a way is what uh, post-colonial literature might be often doing, but with a, a bristling, difficult and unyielding it's a counter literature, we might say, this time, which could be characterized as the, as the Palestinian literature of late colonialism. A literature that, in certain respects, is, is affiliated to the radical challenge offered by the earlier generation of anti colonial writers, of whom Said himself was a late contemporary, uh, Iqbal Ahmad, Henry Cesar Hassan, uh, and C.L.R. James. Said was, was, he was born 10 years old. 
pop generation rates are. Franco Moretti, in his uh, essay, Conjectures on World Digital 2000, uh, makes this remark, which I, which I find uh, <coughs> has always resonated with me, which is, I quote, historical conditions reappear as a sort of crack in the form. Historical conditions reappear as a crack in the form. And no more, nowhere more so, I'd argue, than in Palestinian literature. It's a simultaneous fragmentation of Palestine spatially, its restrictions and unending limits, its stuttering historical progress, or perhaps regress, uh, as a political entity, give it a different relation, I want to argue, to space and time, as they typically project in literature, particularly the novel. What's, what's noticeable about many literary texts from Palestine is that they resist the neatness of the novel form. And we remember that historically the novel <coughs> developed itself in a certain kind of steady bourgeois society that identified as a creation of the rise of the bourgeoisie and the nation state. The novel, in fact, as a form, really assumes this underlying political, physical, temporal stability. So in any novel, the hero or the heroine may go away, but the place to which, from which they leave is always there to return back to. Think of that in literature, Tom Jones, or always leaving at the end, they always return. It's always still there for them to go back to. While the novel is often about that sort of youthful breaking away from a society that offers too much steadiness, too much constriction, its narrative form continues to mimic the solidity of the society that it often interrogates. And it's for this reason that I, I like to suggest, uh, <coughs> tentatively of course, that Middle Eastern fiction seems to fall into two distinct uh, patterns. But the, the effect of different situations of time and political space. In countries, I'd, I'd argue, like Egypt here, or perhaps Morocco, Whatever the regime is at a particular moment, the state itself has a certain historical stability, with more or less uh, enduring uh, historical, historical uh, identity. Not necessarily borders, because they tend to fluctuate, but, but uh, the center is always there. There's nowhere after all more ancient than Egypt. So not with, notwithstanding its intermittent mutuated revolutionary moments, Side of view, 1919, 1922, Egypt itself, its identity, its history has never been in doubt. You, you never have to, as it were, worry about the existence of Egypt. <clears throat> that stability, I think, has allowed Egyptian writers to accommodate and transform the European novel uh, uh, from the 19th century onwards in novels written in the <coughs> European historical or realist uh, tradition. In the earlier novels of Mehdi Mahfouz. You can see in the historical time frame encompassed, for example, by Mahfouz's Cairo trilogy, the inherent stability in some sense of Egyptian society and its history. Mahfouz could appropriate the, the form of the European novel uh, that had developed over the same period uh, as the post westphalian emergence of the European nation, when European nations were, for the first time, of course, creating their own. Identities, their own stabilities, their own languages as well. And the stability of the nation, its borders, the apparatus of the state, enabled the novelist to present historical narratives which were predicated on the basis of the temporal and spatial stability of that state. Its narratives reflect and sustain those political qualities even when the action may last no more than a day. It's always still there, solidly behind us. But compare that stability uh, <coughs> with that of Palestine or the Lebanon perhaps, whose histories have been inextricably intertwined. Uh, <coughs> uh, try and, uh, I won't start to try and recount the history of uh, <coughs> uh, Palestine and Lebanon from 1990, 1919 onwards, uh, but of course it's extraordinarily complex and uh, fractured. 
The novelistic representation of the Lebanese situation uh, <coughs> of stability and disruption has been explored at length in Ken Signori's powerful critical monograph, Standing by the Ruins. And it's perhaps been most powerfully embodied in the fiction of Punta um, for example, in The Tiller of Waters in 2001, whose surreal, disjunctive, disoriented <coughs> idiom figures and follows uh, as an effect of the destruction of their uh, and of life in its ruins. But it's very striking to me that, that in that novel, for example, the ancient, uh, apparently 7,000 years history of Beirut, uh, the constant rebuilding and destruction of Beirut, actually allows the narrator to place its present destruction in a cyclical pattern that defines the identity of the city itself. So instead of uh, the, the civil war, instead of destroying Beirut, uh, <coughs> as someone like myself might naively think, uh, actually, in some way, defines and marks the nature of Beirut itself. It, it actually, the, the destruction of the city is a, is a very mark of, of the, its Beirutness, if you like, because it's happened so many times before and it, it's intrinsically part of Beirut's history. But what of Palestine, <coughs> dismembered, carved up, concreted over? The novel form, whose particular narrative structure implies that temporal continuity and formal resolution, wasn't only less established as a literary genre, of course, uh, in Arabic, but it showed itself profoundly unsuited uh, in its European form to the temporal and spatial dislocations of Palestinian history in the 20th and 21st centuries. The fragmentation of Palestine spatially, its geographical restrictions and zones, segmentation and zoning, its endless bureaucratic restrictions and limitations and unending serial physical forms of barrier uh, and limits, to say nothing of its historical stuttering progress as a political entity, give it a different relation to space and time than that that's typically projected in the Western novel. As Elias Khoury found when he wrote about Palestine in Gate of the Sun, it's hard to work stable narrative into, in, 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 a, in a novel about Palestine. Or just like the succession of cameras that get destroyed in the film Five Broken Cameras, the Palestinian narrative has always been smashed, it's always been broken up. And this, I think, explains the relatively minor place that fiction has actually played in Palestinian literature. Sign began, in fact, in the 1970s, I think, to, to, to suggest that Palestinian literature has, is intrinsically broken uh, and unfinished formally. Uh, <laughs> constituted in structures and genres that disavow typical literary generic modes that were created for those stable description conditions that I just described. And this argument was to merge with the intransigent imaginative geography of the exiled intellectual in one of Said's most remarkable books, I think, After the Last Sky, published in 1986. <coughs> it's an exile's reconstruction uh, remembering the dismembered of Palestine and its diasporic people. There's certainly an element of lateness here. Uh, there's a sense of belatedness both of Palestine as a country and its culture. Saeed uh, <coughs> characterizes in, in the book, Jabari Ibrahim Jabari's powerful novel, The Search of Ulai Masood, as uh, what he calls an extraordinary work of late blooming Palestinian sensibility. And that late blooming sensibility is then described in terms uh, of it being something distinctively Palestinian. The striking, this is like, the striking thing about Palestinian prose uh, and prose fiction is its formal instability. Our literature, in a certain very narrow sense, is the elusive, resistant reality it tries so often to represent. Most literary critics in Israel and the West focus on what is said in Palestinian writing, who is described, or the plot and contents delivered, the realist form, if you like their sociological and political meaning. But it's form that should be looked at. Particularly in fiction, the struggle to achieve form expresses the writer's efforts to construct a coherent narrative. A narrative that might overcome the almost metaphysical impossibility of representing the present. The characteristic mode, then, is not narrative in which scenes take place seriatim, but rather broken narratives, fragmentary compositions, and the self-consciously staged testimonials in which the narrative voice keeps stumbling over itself, its obligations and its limitations. So what, what science is implying here is that, that uh, conventional realism, uh, 
with his narrative. It's very different, it's very distant from the, from the characteristic mode of Palestinian prose. Those historical conditions, we might say, uh, of Palestine appear as cracks in the form. They appear <coughs> literally uh, in, the, in, in the devastated and uh, forcibly transformed landscape of contemporary Palestine, together with its extraordinary historical appropriation and destruction, the, lock, the loss and lack of place, the shifting internal and external borders, the redrawn maps, the evaporating cultural memory of a lost physical landscape, the ugly, unyielding grey concrete rooted into the beautiful terrain in the hills, the continuing ferocity of police and military incursions. All these historical acts of violence emerge in their own way in the fissured, unstable form of this literature. Its fragmentariness and struggle with representation and narrative that Said articulates, anticipates, I want to argue, well, I want to point out so many of the qualities that he later talks about in late style. In the situation where what Jean Grancière has called the distribution of the sensible, has been appropriated and made inaccessible to Palestinians, then formal narrative as developed in Western literature becomes almost impossible. And much Palestinian literature, from Mahmoud Dawish to Ibrahim Nasrallah in Palestinian comedy, refuses conventional kinds of, kinds of narrativity in order to elaborate the disrupted relations in which space and time themselves have been turned into a bizarre geometry of fictional reality. This challenging context in which the normative <coughs> uh, forms of fiction are made impossible demonstrates, I think, why the novel was proved so problematic. Late style may seem at first to be very different from what Hassan Kanafani had in mind when he identified Palestinian literature as resistant literature, al Adab and Boko Haram. The famous picture of Said, supposedly on the Lebanese border. But actually, even in, in that essay, Kanfani does describe resistance literature and poetry as the breaking of form. He says, quote, in form and technique, it rejected the traditional poetic forms and adapted modern techniques without losing force. The breaking of traditional forms, of course, is characteristic of all modernist Arabic poetry, but its significance, I think, in Palestinian poetry is, is uh, overdetermined. And the difference would be that whereas in poetry we have the breaking of traditional form in prose, in the novel in particular, it was never formally established in the first place, which made experimentation much easier. Experimentation wasn't so simple to attempt uh, uh, in order to make it new and established literature with its avant-garde, but something a writer couldn't avoid, given the unsuitability of traditional form. So Palestinian prose is actually rich in writings outside the novel. The characteristic of the prose form, as, as Say mentioned, was, is the um, fragmentary memoir, the testimonial in which the narrative always keeps stumbling over itself. Uh, the testimonial particularly, of course, of exile uh, and of return, as in Gerda Kami's return of Palestinian memoir of 2015. Memoirs which carry no expectation of holistic narratives of fiction are well suited to portraying or reminiscing about movement and restriction in space, as for example in the poet Murid Miracuz, <coughs> as Ramallah. The memoir of the poet returning to the West Bank from which he'd been excluded after being at university here in Egypt in 1967, he was brought out by the 67 war and couldn't return, until finally permitted to return to Ramallah uh, 30 years later. And as you know, that memoir begins with that, that very slow and painful walk across the Allenbury Bridge. Uh, but the, the point of the title is that actually he doesn't get back to Jerusalem, he just saw the uh, You can't, of course, see, uh, <coughs> uh, sorry, close to Jerusalem, but you're, they're not there, and access is restricted. So Palestinian uh, life isn't so much about place and space, you could say, uh, as about the restrictions. Uh, that surround Palestinians, about travel and residence. It's become wholly subsumed by material requirements and barriers, such as permits, telephones, checkpoints, roadblocks, searches, detention, and deportation. And here's a checkpoint which actually just simply cuts off access. Uh, it isn't really a checkpoint at all, because you're not allowed to go through. 
under these uh, conditions, we would uh, find an accentuation of the degree to which a return can never be a return, how the stranger can never go back to where he or she was, uh, and perceives that the enforced blockage of movement for Palestinians is part of a larger strategy of containment in space and time, designed deliberately to produce a lack of coherence, a lack of uh, symmetry uh, with the present, uh, a, primitive, a primitive colonized society, as he puts it, I quote, they moved forward as fast as they could and made sure we would keep moving backwards. Take a simple example. <coughs> There's no 3G uh, network in Palestine. Um, so it's deliberately kept primitive uh, and backwards. In a situation in which territory has disappeared when place and space have been appropriated where access has been made possible, Palestinian writing reproduces stages and at once removes that impossibility its emphasis also on walking, uh, with reimagined possibilities of moving through deep on space. This preoccupation with the reappropriation of space through movement has been central to some Palestinian writing, particularly Rosh Shahadi's recent work, where he, because he Shahadi has developed a, a form, we can call it the peripatetic memoir, the years on the hills outside Ramallah. His excursion in texts such as Palestinian walks evoke and chart the slow closing in of available space as the landscape gets appropriated <coughs> um, by the settlements, of course, by the extraterritorial Israeli only uh, highways that cut through the landscape of the West Bank in their sealed corridors, by the gaunt, ghostly grey concrete in the proliferating uh, separation walls. Shahani performs acts of respatialization in his texts that are largely performed uh, through historical memory, <clears throat> returning to memories of his earlier life or to the Ottoman period when space was humanely organized in this region in an open, inaccessible way. In, those, in that time, you could walk from Allah to Jerusalem to Istanbul or to <laughs> There was no barrier that uh, you could simply uh, traverse. His texts full of frustration and nostalgia also, of course, uh, propose a new form of agency and resistance. And then after The Last Sky, after some particularly bleak uh, remarks about the present uh, situation in 1986, Saeed remarks, yet the Palestinian works anyway, often without much hope or horizon, with the result that alienation from work is now gradually being assimilated and transformed into a prevailing attitude. <coughs> described and characterized by Rosh Hashimah Shahada as Samuq, to stay put, to cling to our houses and land by all means available. And Samuq, of course, as you know, means perseverance, steadfastness, and has been developed by Shahada into a strategy of <coughs> Samadina, the practice of creating non-violent resistance in the form of exactly that, hanging on, uh, associated particularly, he's a, a lawyer, uh, with hanging on to the land, to the locality, refusing exile, diaspora. Samud encompasses the larger refusals of Palestinians ever to give up their claim to the homeland, refusing, as uh, Darwish puts it, ever, even ever to give up the right to wait. And the doggedness of Samud is also transformed into creativity, political and aesthetic, the monumentality of self-assertion in Palestinian writing. That, in quality, that quality of intransigence, difficulty uh, that Saeed finds in late style could be described uh, as his own version uh, of Samud, resistance in life and art. And that's how I want to suggest the effect of late colonialism in, in, in Palestinian art. Not resolution and harmony, but resistance, untimeliness, anachronism that's almost also modern. And lateness that leaves you uncomfortable outside your comfort zone. Now, the, the olive tree, which of course is so much a symbol of, of Palestinian brutalness, unfortunately, uh, as we know, um, <coughs> um, hardly forms any obstacle at all, uh, certainly to the Israelis, uh, who like nothing better uh, <coughs> than to bring in their bulldozers to uproot the ancient trees that uh, dot uh, this, the Palestinian landscape and give, of course, evidence of centuries of life uh, in that region. Jihadi also emphasizes in his, emphasizes in his wanderings um, <clears throat> uh, another aspect, which is the, the Palestinian remains that won't go away. 
such as the ruined cousin that he finds and celebrates in Palestinian walks. And after the last sky, uh, Saeed, just after he'd been describing the broken narrative of Palestinian literature, which I mentioned, cited before, suddenly adds, each Palestinian structure presents itself as a potential ruin. The theme of a formerly proud family house, village, city, camp, now wrecked, now left behind, or owned by someone else, turns up everywhere in our literature and cultural heritage. I think that's an extraordinary statement. Each Palestinian structure presents itself as a potential ruin, apparently anticipating the future, even the destruction of Palestine itself. And he calls, calls up here a dominant image of the Palestinian tragedy, the ruined Palestinian village, Kerala. That deep symbiotic relation between ruin and Palestine uh, since 1948 is totally fundamental. And in the history of art, I studied argues. Uh, in late style, and it's impossible that he wouldn't have been fully alert to the resonance of the final word that he cites here from Adorno. In the history of art, he says, late works are the catastrophe. Said suggests here that Palestinian literature isn't only constitutively fragmented, but that it can be connected to the idea of the ruin, which of course is a fragment. Uh, or to the ruin as a potential form of Palestinian culture. And the ruin is, is, is a very interesting concept because it symbolizes at once uh, the breakdown of Palestinian history, of course, its destruction, the fractured state of Palestine. Uh, <clears throat> but we can also um, and, uh, see that uh, Palestinian literature also mimics the idea of the ruin, uh, of the ruined villages that remain visible invisible, but that, that actually isn't to say that it's simply ruined in the normal sense that we might say that, or organado, as it can say, but rather the ruin itself is an awkward persistence, an uncomfortable unsettling, unease, a discomfort, ubahar, uh, sumu, you might say. And so Said develops these broken fragments, these ravaged ruins, these now empty villages, these remains that refuse to budge, that to go away into a specific aesthetic, uh, Palestinian aesthetic of resistance to transform the ruin, the mark of negativity from the past that lives on in the present, lateness, into a new labor of aspiration by survivors of the future. Because a potential ruin, if you think about his phrase, is also a ruin with a potential. <laughs> so it's not only looking backwards to the past, but it's actually itself pointing forward uh, in some way to the future, like the fragment itself is, of course, the romantics, the German romantics, the artists, the <coughs> theorists. Ruins are a marker of the endurance of the past into the future. It's not just negativity, it's lateness itself, a survivor that lives on, uh, a ruin whose symbols continue to speak to futurity. last aspect of late style I want to emphasize, and this is something actually uh, that Saeed, I think, um, in a way, uh, misses out, um, but somehow is implicitly there in the landscape, that he, the literary landscape that he, that he describes. Um, the situation, of course, in, of Palestine, uh, it's not, it's cliche to say it's one of the greatest tragedies of our time, it's a, it's a tragic situation, but uh, if I, I want to argue that Palestinian culture and cultural production is actually much more dialectical than that. Uh, that actually Palestinians find a way of dealing with that tragedy by invoking comedy. Uh, and one thing that Saeed, I think, misses in his account uh, <coughs> of Palestinian writing is the role that comedy itself plays. Not there, but <laughs> he's right. Its fragmentation allows us to develop, uh, allows it to develop in ironic forms. That's the whole point about putting bits together. You ironize each each different one. Uh, that sometimes uh, gets the border on farce. As Samar Jerusi has, has pointed out, there's a comic tradition in Palestinian writing where the tragic merges with the comic, and the ironic mode underlies the most serious thematic involvement, which goes back to the um, <coughs> the uh, poetry of Ibrahim Dukh. And whose major expression in prose can be found in the work of Amir Habibi, author of the most successful uh, Palestinian novel of the 20th century, The Secret Life of Saeed. 
the Basotos. The ironic and ironizing narrative of Khabib's novel conveys and evokes the disorientation of subjection of life in Israel and Palestinians in the pre and post 67 periods. And what's different about it is, is that the comedy somehow represents, I think, or creates a, a triumph over circumstance where tragic uh, representation simply, you could argue, uh, succumbs to it. The experimental novel of uh, the Said <coughs> in 45 different sections uh, is again deliberately episodic, broken, uh, uh, and unstable. That sort of stutters arbitrarily from one episode to, to the next in a series of surreal, fragmented, perennially disrupted, and totally improbable in many cases, but at the same time, sort of incredible as well. Uh, and it moves until it reaches its, its fantastic uh, supernatural conclusion. And the broken, disoriented form of the novel mirrors the paradoxical situation of Said himself, who is, of course, paradox, he's an, he's an illegal person in his own country. Um, <clears throat> and uh, what that, of course, is, is, is articulated is the bizarre historical situation uh, to live as a Palestinian under Israeli rule. It's not only harsh and degrading, but it's also absurd and surreal. And one way, that, one of the most effective ways of, to deal with the almost unbearable oppression is to ironize it and to laugh, if you can, to survive through laughter, through turning it into comedy. The absurdity, it's already comic, because of the absurdity of Israeli governments, of the Arab population, um, uh, is uh, what Habibi brings out in the history of Palestine. We find it, I think, in other writings, um, such as uh, Suad Amri's wonderful Sharon and my mother-in-law, uh, which is a wonderful set of, uh, <coughs> of uh, <coughs> reminiscences, or the videos of Amar Shamani, the pixelated intifada, for example, where, um, uh, which is actually based on a true story that uh, 18 Palestinian cows were declared a threat to Israeli national security and uh, were searched for um, and were hidden by search for. Or magnificently, I think, in the films of Elia Suleiman. And the time is uh, running over, I just want to run you, show you a very short uh, <coughs> clip from uh, the time that remains, just to give you an idea of how, 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 to, how um, some Palestinian artists deal with the absurdity uh, of the occupation. So I think that's a good illustration of the way that actually for people living in the West Bank, I guess that is, uh, <coughs> comedy is, is the survival mechanism. Uh, uh, and one of the things which, of course, the state of Israel has absolutely no <coughs> um, 
either their air defenses or their over fortified army can actually uh, come to their aid and shut it with conquering of their cities. So, uh, Palestinian aesthetics, I think, are more dialectical than, than uh, Saeed had asked for, since that comic ironizing uh, mode of substitute, subterfuge is, is uh, particularly practiced internally within Israel and Palestine. Uh, and maybe there's a distinction one can make there. <clears throat> Diasporic Palestinians tend to emphasize the tragic mode, uh, whereas actually people living inside, whichever the borders uh, are, uh, <clears throat> survive through tragic comedy, through turning it into uh, comedy. Either way, it remains the case that the Stalin is, this, is a Palestinian way of being Intransigence, if you like, uh, indifference, of being blocked, uh, a forced exile, whether political or intellectual. But if, as Adorno argued, every intellectual in immigration is without exception damaged, then paradoxically, as we've seen, I think, the physical and, and political collateral damage of exile is also uh, functions as a kind of crucible of creativity. And Said ends his chapter on Jimmy with uh, a provocative claim. I don't think it's wrong to say that in the 20th century, with very few exceptions, great art in a colonial situation always appears in support of what Jeunet and Le Captif calls the metaphysical uprising of the natives. <clears throat> the cause of Algeria produced Jeunet's Le Caravan, Ponticobo's Battle of Algiers, Fanon's books, the work of Cate Vecina. Compared to these works, Camus Pales, his novels, essays, and stories, the desperate gestures of a fragment fragment. Finally, I'm generous mind. It's good when I'm generous. In Palestine, the same is true, since the radical transformative difficulty in visionary work comes from and on behalf of the Palestinians. Bibi, Darwish, Shabra, Kanafani, Akwan, Kassem, Junne, not from the Israelis. Whereas in 1986, and there's a crucial difference here, which I think is very significant. And after the last sky, Said was lamenting uh, the lack of cultural capital of the Palestinians. By uh, 2003, the productivity, uh, uh, cultural productivity of Palestinians, and particularly writers, has been such that he can not only make this remarkable claim uh, that Palestinian writings form a late style, but even more remarkable, the Palestinian literature is better, more powerful, more radical, transformative, difficult visionary than Israeli literature. And it is the case that Israeli literature, you could argue, is dominated by uh, writers who, who write in what, uh, what I call the Forsterian, as in Ian Forster, mode of liberal colonial guilt. It's a passage to India type uh, guilty liberal colonialist uh, mentality. Um, S. Isa's remarkable 1949 novel, recently translated into English, Arabic Hindi, would be a perfect example of this, of, of this uh, phenomenon. Or, I think, the novels of Emma Sauls, David Goldberg. Uh, and you can see it also even in uh, traces of it in the extraordinary confessions of the former heads of Shin Beit in the 2012 film, The Gatekeepers. This kind of liberal guilt doesn't have the same kind of charge or currency for anyone outside the country uh, as the Palestinian writers do. But it's Said himself who remains the most powerful example, I think, of late style in our time. It bristles with the intractable government. Uh, perseverance, steadfastness of the man, if you think of his, his whole career, um, for values that he believed to be humane and just. And in that context, his preface to the 1999 edition of After the Last Sky comes as something of a declaration of his own role and chosen idiom as a Palestinian writer. After the Last Sky, he declares, is an exile's book in which he was trying, with the aid of, aid of the photographer Jean Marc, to get things right about the subjectivity and historical consciousness of being Palestinian. Things like exile, dispossession, habits of expression, internal and external landscapes, stubbornness, poignancy, and heroism. That's all Saeed. And he continues. It's an unreconciled book. This is uh, 1999. <coughs> um, in which contradictions and antimonies in our lives and experiences remain as they are, assembled neither, I hope, into neat holes nor into sentimental ruminations about the past. 
fragments, memories, disjointed scenes, intimate particulars. It's, it's very much a form of late style. So, <coughs> um, you could say that by, by uh, what happens in late style is he's actually theorizing the very, the very concepts that he's been proposing uh, about Palestinian uh, writing earlier in his life. So it's a theoretical exposition of these, of these concepts from which he starts with which he starts from Adorno. And the words of Adorno on Beethoven that Said himself cites seem to uh, offer an evocative description of Said himself and the way his unreconciled work continues to offer inspiration to so many people. The fragmented landscape is objective while the light by which it alone uh, it glows is subjective. He does not bring about their harmonious synthesis. As a dissociative force, he tears them apart in time, perhaps in order to preserve them for the eternal. In the history of art, late works are the catastrophes. And again, here catastrophe is transformed from its old meaning of disaster to return to its oldest significance, not only uh, of the new, but of a turning upside down, at the end of a one cycle that looks forward to a new cycle. The great thing about catastrophe uh, as uh, <coughs> what many men points out in the of on history is that it's actually again like a really moving forward into futurity. So, as many means suggested, catastrophe is not only the past, its potentiality is forever driving the present into the future. And we could say that in late style also opens up uh, an overturning uh, into futurity. And it's in this way that it always looks towards that future when the condition of the present finally be brought to an end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Monk. Um, um, you mentioned other sites um, emphasizing um, uh, tra the tragic world um, in comparison with um, and um, I wonder if we can uh, read science uh, conversion to humanism mm -hmm. and a special version of humanism at the end is part of the state side project. Mm -hmm. He has a significant uh, book entitled Humanism and Democratic Criticism. Mm -hmm. And I've always read this book as maybe um, <coughs> a kind of shift, if you like. In his position, and with specific right reference to the uh, Palestinian cause, and uh, always keeping in mind his earlier the question of Palestine in 1979, <coughs> he said this is with his with his politics, we are all, etc. Mm -hmm. And he has this very famous uh, saying: "Solidarity, never solidarity before criticism." You mm -hmm. see. And this whole data project of auto data is like. Mm -hmm. So, um, is it fair to say that um, humanism mm -hmm. is part of science and science? Well, yes and no. I think uh, I don't. I don't. I don't quite agree. I think you said his conversion. To you. I. I think science is always a humanist picture, uh, and. I'd, I'd argue that the basis of his, his whole argument in Orientalism was precisely it was a dehumanizing characterization of other people and, and their cultures. And he does have this uh, tendency in the book, which actually I criticize him for, in my which I give up at all, to invoke um, certain sort of human, humanist touchstones, actually. Besides Yates, for example, I think a couple of times, uh, as, the, as the very thing that Orientalism is betraying. Uh, so I think I, I would agree with you that I think it was, it was there, but I, I suppose the other thing I'd add is that what you're suggesting is very interesting because uh, maybe you could argue that, that Said, of course, who, who lived and breathed and thought Palestine 24 7. Uh, at some point, didn't need to speak about it in the same way. We've already spoken about 
so much that he didn't have anything explicitly to say that he had already said in certain ways. But actually what he was trying to do in his, his last words was, was theorize the underlying concept that uh, he already had actually attached, if you like, to his, his vision of Palestinian culture. So I, th I think that would be a very nice way of putting it. Stories actually uh, that are plausible stories you know, to get into the country. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and uh, we were in Jenin in one of the in a theatre there, and one of the people said to me, We have to uh, pursue a form of parkour, you know, with the, with the kids do on there, <clears throat> running and jumping and so on. Because they, how do you live with all these properties? And so, forth? well, actually, of course, you. you illegally and you indulge in all sorts of illegality, you smuggle yourself in, you you steal a car with Israeli plates and pretend you're an Israeli and you're, you're, sort of, you're, you're acting, you have to perform all the time uh, in, in not comic but, but the way that people talk about it to themselves is often in the comic mode. Uh, because there's no point, I suppose, you know, to, to deal with you can't sit around forever and just say, oh, what is here? Got to somehow survive. And the Suat Amiri's book, I think, is a wonderful example of what 
or through something. Uh, one of the examples of uh, living under siege in Ramallah, you actually survive by turning the whole thing into content. Uh, so it's a survival mechanism, but it's also actually, it's a real resistance mechanism too, because of course it does not to survive. So but I think it is something that really has to only come out from, from within uh, and you couldn't possibly present it that way from the, the outside because that would be something too awful. <laughs> so, yeah. I could just follow up quickly on the uh, issue of comedy, which I was also fascinated about. When we teach literature to you know, freshmen, we talk about the two figures of the, the tragic curve that goes down at the end and the comic curve that leads to resolution and the happy ending and the shape of the place of the weddings at the end. Obviously, this is a kind of comedy that is not resolved, but is in fact, as you, as you mentioned, it doesn't have this kind of overarching harmonization in the narrative structure. There's, there's always this kind of dissonant, continuing. Uh, it, it's it's a it's a kind of a, it's a new kind of comedy. It seems like it's obviously it's ironic, but it also doesn't have that. It, I mean, it almost seems to lack the uh, the telos of that, yeah. of that, the belief in that kind of happening. I wonder if that's you see it. You're right, uh, it, it, it breaks that form because it can't. If you, typically, yes, the, the comic perspective is a way of reconciling the weirdness of the world and tragic events and so forth. Uh, <coughs> in, even in Dante, you know, formerly comedy has so its characteristics, but the, the kind of comedy I'm talking about doesn't. and. Uh, if you take a film like The Time of the Remains, so there's no ending really. Uh, and so it, 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 it uh, doesn't belong to that particular dominant uh, digital. Those kind of things were kind of musical set. Modern music. Modern music. Modern music. Modern music. Unresolved comedy. Yeah, yeah, a new kind of, a new kind of comedy in that, in that sense. Yes, so there's, there's no. Uh, well, the comedy makes you feel good, of course, uh, as in that scene. Of course, <laughs> but as Suleiman himself, who's the Buster Keaton figure, uh, clearly, as he's too frightened, unlike the other guy, he's totally frightened by the tank. Uh, that's how you actually feel. <laughs> so it's a, it's a way of making you feel good when actually the situation is, is bad, and uh, as long as the situation is bad, it's, it's never going to be resolved. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on the notion of plagiarism being deliberately unproductive productiveness. Is this stem from um, the author's sense of disillusion that they no longer search for a sense of productiveness? Yes, I don't, I don't think disillusionment. I wouldn't use that term, actually. Uh, I think that, that goes back to the, to the, to the Beethoven. Where the, the, the point about Beethoven's late style uh, is that he really, for the first time in this sort of fits maybe a bit, um, he, he basically uh, challenges the established harmonies of, of classical music. And the reason why his late works are so difficult um, to, like, uh, 70, 80 years, to, to really be uh, received in any understood, you could say, in any sense. Uh, is is because uh, they they seem to be going nowhere. It's exactly there's no ending. It's, 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 there's no resolution. And there's no harmony that, that comes in. If you think of any classical symphony, there's always this sort of loud bit at the end, a bit of a crescendo, and you know that's it. Uh, but but late Beethoven doesn't have that, that that quality at all. So this it's sort of unproductive in the sense that. Uh, it doesn't seem to be going anywhere, I think you could say. It's got this little blockage to it, but it's actually, at the same time, it's productive because it's so, it's so radically challenging and innovative. So it, it's this contradictory quality uh, of creativity coming out of blockage, if you like, uh, plus and minus at the, at the same time uh, that, that Adorno is pointing his finger at. I, th I think clearly what, <coughs> of course, Saeed is a great musician, a great pianist himself, 
uh, and a lot of his later writings are about music. Uh, and again, I used to, in my stupidity, uh, <laughs> think, you know, why is he, you get so excited about the political scene, and you know, why is Saeed writing about music uh, and not what we, we knew Saeed also wrote about? It. Why is he new about music? And it's like something. <clears throat> Aspect of, of uh, Palestinian culture, and, but but it's exactly that that he saw in certain forms of music a way of thinking about uh, a, a cultural form that would be meaningful for himself and for uh, the Palestinians, and, and it, it's exactly that. It's, it's it's being productive in a situation where you're totally locked and you can't end, uh, and you can't resolve, it, and you can't actually name. Produce that moment of closure uh, in the way that you can, of course, let's say, in any uh, <coughs> romantic novel or Jane Austen. Uh, uh, <coughs> typically, every novel has a, has a moment of, of, of closure at the end, uh, like <coughs> from Shakespeare, Last Place, and the Theatre to, to, to Fiction. And it's that, it's that quality, but it's, it's not the result. So it's got to be this contradictory. But it's not. It's not from. It's. It's not disillusionment. It's. It's blockage. And of course, it's frustration too. There's a lot of frustration in Beethoven's late work, and partly because of his deafness, of course. Uh, he was in that sort of situation himself, and that's why he elaborated this this new musical landscape that was found to be so rich. I think we could look at Palestinian literature as a, as a, in the same way as actually, in its aesthetic, affording a richness for, for others uh, without appropriating it or marginalizing you know, it. But it's a, it's a very radical thing. Finally, uh, I think there is a there is a degree to which. Uh, when you look at the extraordinary creativity of Palestinian people in the setting of uh, different forms of art, uh, visual arts, film, writing, um, it's, it's actually been, it has been an amazing phenomenon, uh, particularly in the last 25, 30 years. Uh, a lot of it, of course, uh, particularly things like uh, Solomon's films, which need money. Uh, to happen at all. Uh, a lot of it is supported by, for example, the European Union and funded by the European Union. Uh, and I think there is, a, there is a, there are two things you can say about that. One is that Palestinian people in Palestine are so locked that uh, art is all they can do. Uh, because of you know, what do you do? Uh, of course, they're resisting all the time. It's not a substitute for them, but it's, it's something that uh, can make that up in, in, in conditions of oppression. Uh, I think for, for a larger political scale, yeah, funding for Palestinian culture can, by state, can be simply a substitute for kind of assuaging the good of the fact that they're not doing anything good. So and I think actually the European Union, you could say that to the European Union, um, they, they give lots of money to Palestinians, but what have they, what have they actually done for Palestinians in political terms? I'd like to, to know. <laughs> so to that, to that extent, I, I, would, I would really agree with you uh, that there's a real danger in thinking by encouraging art and so that this is wonderful, but actually uh, it's, it's a way of not thinking about the, the basic situation. Uh, <clears throat> nevertheless, I, I think uh, I think what what Said saw was that you don't necessarily have to have a simple opposition between art and politics. And one of the things that, that I've certainly seen, <coughs> uh, if you like, I would say, historian of anti-colonial movements, uh, 
is that the thing that is characteristic of successful anti-colonial movements is that is that they have created a cultural anchor, uh, and it's very hard to measure what the effects of that was, uh, but it somehow has given uh, an impetus and given given people an identity and given people a form of coherence that seems to have uh, produced or ended by the emergence of, of successful anti colonial uh, struggles. So <clears throat> the best, or the, the originators of that, uh, the Irish who basically originated every anti colonial strategy in the book. And what you can see with the Irish is, <clears throat> is they basically tried everything. You know, um, so they have a cultural revival. Uh, a lot of huge output of uh, cultural production, writing, and so forth. But of course, they've also got the IRB, they were, of course, blowing up London with bombs from the 1860s, even before the invention of Jellyman. Uh, uh, they uh, organized uh, the invasion of Canada um, from the United States, we all forget that, uh, with the idea that they could occupy Montreal and hold it ransom for Dublin. <laughs> Uh, they assassinated um, British royal families when they visited New Zealand on all the tours. You know, they, they were doing everything, and sometimes they would resist very actively, like an intifada, and that would take the fall, and then they'd be repressed, and then they would then you, you'd have a, a sort of much emphasis on cultural forms of resistance, but that in itself would then build up to the next wave. You know, so, so I, I think you've got to see these things dialectically. They actually do hold together and are part of the emergence uh, of uh, what have been ultimately successful movements. And you know, one thing you can say as a historian of anti colonial movements is it's historically, it's actually never been possible to oppress a people against their will for ever. Nobody has actually managed in the end. Sustain their will, it always breaks down, uh, it has always broken down. So uh, <coughs> you can see that from, from the whole history of colonization, think of it, you know, two thirds, three quarters of the world colonized uh, against their will. Uh, it sustained hundreds, maybe 500 years in some cases, but in the end, uh, it can't be sustained, and particularly when the people themselves, as a group en masse, uh, refuse to sustain them. This is Gandhi's very point. India. He said, we've allowed the colonization to happen. It's our responsibility. Don't, you know, don't just blame the British. We've actually allowed them to be here. We cooperate with them. We, we, we form the Indian Army, which polices India. Uh, or, or more polices. Um, so, uh, and it was when the, the, the cooperation of everyday people in India broke down towards the end of the Second World War that India became a government. Uh, so this collective will is, is really, really important. Uh, it may take you know, any amount of time, but, but actually, historically, uh, it always happens in, in the end. So you know, you've got to see it in that context, I think. Uh, but, and I, but which means, of course, not just you know, clearly the history context. It's not just another kind of writing. It's, it's a very different kind of writing. It's a special kind of writing. And we've got to be aware of think of that all the time. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, it's a good question. I don't know where we're at, but um, I just wanted to ask something about uh, a conversation that you had at the beginning of your talk and kind of circle back to the beginning of your talk. I think it was, I think you were putting up in the I'm not sure. Um, said compost stations of revolution. And I think that was with him discussing uh, his perspective on post-colonial studies as something that was suspicious or that he was kind of uncomfortable with or saw himself outside of. And um, I thought it was interesting uh, that you discussed kind of the question of Palestine today as outside post-colonial studies um, in its most central or most um, I guess 
hottest topics. So I think um, my question is about outsidership um, and about how, of course, someone at the front asks maybe uh, Edward Said was never uh, comfortable enough to create any kind of humor out of the situation because he himself was an outsider. And of course, you know that um, his outsidership was very important to him. He able to be more being out of place in the sense that it's a kind of productivity in, in this frustration. So I wanted to ask how um, kind of Palestine is with the but also with him. Post-colonial studies makes it um, top. You haven't studied these works uh, about the Zahid so closely. How do you see the question of Palestine as related to post-colonial studies and whether it's productive or frustrating? Or um, what could maybe be the trajectory be? What could be the trajectory in the future? having to do with this uh, complicated frustration that is somewhat unaddressed and uh, hasn't played out yet in the same way that race violence is a long time to play out. Mm. Uh, oh, gosh. Interesting, difficult question. Um, <clears throat> uh, one thing, uh, I suppose, that you could say is, is Palestine studies is not technically part of post-colonial studies precisely because it is not post-colonial, um, and therefore it's 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 very it has a very different status, uh, and that leads to, that means academically people who work on it tend to be in in Eastern studies or rather than in post-colonial studies or they, they tend to be. I, I'm not particularly bothered at some level whether it's in post-colonial studies or not, or whether that might be in uh, uh, But it's also part of, uh, certainly in the US, where people think of post-colonial uh, studies very often as simply one of the, a, a series of literary movements, and they're always on what's the next thing, you know, so, uh, what's the next theory. You know, so, uh, <coughs> uh, the point, the point is that there is this relatedness and anachronism that if, if people make a, a declaration, as in the, the well-known round table in the PMLA is at the end of post-colonial theory, you've got to say, well, actually, the world is not post-colonial entirely. Uh, and that's, that's been one of my particular charges, um, shall I say, uh, is, is, is precisely that to, to, to to remind ourselves exactly the degree to which there are, there are elements of coloniality, of course, uh, <laughs> in many different ways. And uh, I think uh, probably what I would argue is that, is that actually the, the impact of, of Saeed's work uh, in, in the context of what I was talking about today is, is really to, is, as far as it develops a new theory of, of literature and culture, Specific one, shall we say, uh, that that actually is a, is a field in itself, in a way, or so so field. It's not part of anything else. And uh, the first question really <coughs> emphasized that too that science ambition was actually to theorize something that is beyond something that could just be real, not be part of post-colonial studies. Uh, and actually, post-colonial studies doesn't, doesn't matter in any sense. In to the issue of so, so I, th I think he, we could say that, that by, by shifting Palestinian situation out of, out of uh, a, a, I should say, a, a straightforward political area studies domain uh, and actually broadening its base, he has done something very clever, very important, very powerful. Uh, which is why I, which is why I want to sustain it, help to sustain it, because that's actually pushing the whole thing to a, to, to a different level. And whatever postmodern studies may or may not be um, addressing is it's kind of gone beyond the door. It's, it's 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 a different domain, and, uh, and I think it, it really was a remarkable thing that. Was, was doing. Well, um, I'm kind of confused because um, 
there are some calls now um, that are facing resistance with the word or with the wrong term of uh, forgiveness. So many people are talking about forgiving the enemy and uh, starting from the beginning again, this kind of, uh, to achieve this kind of coexistence. So, do you think that in the future we're going to look at the uh, side as uh, an attribute of evil, violence, someone who is um, uh, pushing people to keep fighting against this kind of forgiveness? Um. I think uh, you might say that about Fonsano. Uh, but to be fair to Fanon, he, he died also before the conflict was ended. Um, but uh, it certainly his, his emphasis on, on violence and on violent resistance, on the resistance, uh, which we say is, is difficult. Um, and the, even if you look at the context in which he was advocating that book, it, it's problematic. Uh, uh, <coughs> Said was never, I don't know, in that sense, he was, he was never arguing for violent resistance in that form, of that kind. And in fact, he's, uh, <coughs> it's true, he, he, after his political involvement ended, when he fell out with Arafat, after 1993, and the Oslo Agreement, which you can see was a total disaster, uh, he, he kind of backed away with, and uh, looked for other forms of involvement, you, you could say. Um, but I think the, the degree to which actually his values were humanistic uh, should never be involved. He, he, he was talking about people who have been, been subjected to this fragmentation violence and uh, if you go to uh, anywhere that, 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 that people are living under those conditions and actually see what they're like, they're terrified. I mean, they are. It's, it's, most, it's like being in a prison camp, but a violent prison camp, with incursions at any time. Knock on, the, knock on the door in the middle of the night, you know, everybody that's a constant threat and of course it's killings. So it's a very violent situation, and, and certainly you can't. <clears throat> I don't think you can just place it on one side. It's a, it's a, it's a neutral one. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but Said was actually arguing for for a humanism where people could actually reconcile <coughs> those those differences and, and recognise their humanness. And of course, his friendship with uh, Daniel Van Gogh and Eastwood. West of one orchestra, which now really doesn't continue in the same way, uh, was 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 part of that, uh, and uh, it's true that if actually people could see that, uh, then there wouldn't be any need for the violence that happens. Um, what makes this situation actually any worse is um, social networks nowadays, because uh, those people are represented now as advocates of violence. They are not the advocates of peace and uh, coexistence anymore. So um, we find many books about Holocaust and how they were, um, I don't know, it's talking about the injustice that took place to those people. And they forgot that what was happening in Palestine is also a Holocaust. So how can we find the balance again? How can we um, um, highlight um, the principles of Said, the <coughs> principles of Said? Of Said and uh, bring them back to life again. Uh, in return of, or uh, actually, uh, I think of the power of the social media, they can force people to think of them as the opposite. So that's uh, kind of the dilemma nowadays. Yeah, so I think uh, that characterization of Saeed was long before social media. <laughs> he was called the Professor of Terror uh, long before uh, Facebook. Existing. Um, so uh, it's a very the, the problem with the whole situation in Israel Palestine is is to, it's very difficult. People are very committed to one side or the other, and that's that's what's so difficult in terms of resolving it. 
because pe people's positions are already, their minds are already made up, because, uh, and therefore they just demonize the other side. Uh, so it's, it's, and that's unfortunately becoming more normal as a way of uh, behaving in politics. Uh, so <clears throat> it's not as if other places really are showing ways out of that situation, actually, we're becoming more like that uh, in different parts of the world. Uh, uh, I don't have a simple, simple answer. I wish I did uh, as, to, as, as how to resolve it. Uh, except that you, you can just look to people who, who, who have tried uh, to put forward models for, for how to live that, that uh, can, can offer examples to, to us all. And I think Saeed was one of those. Thank you. Thank you for uh, for this reading, and uh, you encourage me not to uh, read it in and uh, maybe put some explanation to those art uh, chapters in the late style, especially the uh, Shanjini. But uh, I think what late style is more about this interaction between uh, music and language, and uh, it is it's not about. I mean, it's, yes, it's smooth creativity, but it's have some conditions because mostly, especially the examples like statements in the late style, works with large scale forms, with the uh, eye of, of, of musicians who were so disciplined and, and they had like beginnings and development. And then he speaks about this enigmatic uh, sense of you are near that, you don't know it, of course, no one knows. It might be a little late, but it is uh, some kind of enigmatic. And I wonder if uh, there is um, an equivalent uh, on your uh, um, proposal here for the first time art. Is there music on the first time in, that, in, in such way? Not just the language production, which is mm -hmm. definitely, um, it's more, uh, it is more, um, um, I don't know how to say natural to, uh, but uh, I think abstract music and large skill forms are even uh, in, in those times don't exist that much because it's, now it's about uh, really a moment and uh, looping and there's a lot of uh, ways of, of composing that is not related to that, uh, you know, the past of Western music and such composers in that. Um, I, 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 you gave me an idea that he might be talking about the late style of, of culture as we knew, uh, especially uh, most of the late style uh, components relates to something only academics can understand because it, they don't exist anymore and not entirely people can connect to Thomas Mann and position 13. You know, I mean, it is uh, typically um, about the word, about the words. So I, I hope there is something about Portuguese uh, musicians or composers from this time that they can be up to that challenge. Thank you. Uh, I don't I don't know any equivalent in terms of what you could call Palestinian music that would in any way you know, register in terms of what, what side is proposing. He certainly doesn't make any suggestion in, in that domain as far as, as far as I'm aware. Uh, so and his his own musical landscape was was pretty restricted to traditional classical forms. Uh, <coughs> so uh, and uh, one of the criticisms that people make of Saeed is that he was basically a very high culture too. He, he had no time really for popular culture of any, any kind. Um, uh, and that was very much his, his mode. In fact, the first thing he said to me when I first met him was, Did you go to the opera? I was uh, totally intimidated. <laughs> <laughs> Do I go to the opera? Well, no, I, mean, I don't go to the opera. <laughs> 
Um, so, uh, and so he had that, that aspect of the interviews highly integrated in, in place of aesthetic forms, and that, that was sort of one of my leading comments when I was writing about him in white mythologies in particular. But it was part of the whole thing of Orientalism, you know, that, that how far had he gone to actually represent the other cultures who were misrepresented. Um, so, uh, but uh, that was that was him, and you know that, that's what he did. Um, what he what he recognised, though, I think, was that, that um, the, the 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 register of European classical music, uh, which seems to be such a sort of self-contained historical entity. Uh, that, that actually late sound is really about it breaking up. Um, and you could say that, that Sainte doesn't say this, I don't think, but <clears throat> you could say that what 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 Beethoven was doing in his, his late work was actually uh, going or, or interrogating something that had been totally consistent within classical music since the time of Bach, which is the development of, of a certain register of harmonic forms. So, as in the world tempo clavier, the, the development of uh, <coughs> tone, so that you, so that all the different keys could be uh, uh, harmonious with each other, which actually is actually requires them to be distorted. In fact, uh, um, which was developed around our time, uh, is something that had stayed more or less stable until the time of late Beethoven and. So what you could say, going as we were beyond sight, is not being beyond sight is, is not only that it leads to Schoenberg and modern distant talk and talk to talk and scale and so forth, but actually the whole development of music now where actually classical popular or non-classical is sort of broken down and the musicians think in terms of noise uh, not music anymore, so they spend all their time doing the soundscapes of <laughs> which is plenty, <laughs> um, uh, has broken the boundaries of, of the, 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 the art as it consisted. So I think, I think uh, you could develop it in, in that way uh, into, the, into the present and, and into whatever forms of musical uh, activity uh, the radical kind of really are, are happening maybe more in the Lebanon aspect of the um, but, <coughs> but that but Sayyid wasn't didn't go there. But I think he opens the way for, for that thinking because what he's talking about is it's not just artists who are kind of faced in intractable situations and become you know, difficult whatever as such but he's actually talking about the complete breakup for of a, an aesthetic uh, um, uh, what do you call it? Not exactly ideology, but, but uh, aesthetic uh, <coughs> mode that, is, that has existed uh, in, in European classical music for several hundred years. Now. So he's looking at the, the breakdown of that, that norm uh, and looking forward to some radical, innovative new forms. Uh, and as it happens, that's what he sees Palestinian culture as doing. So maybe Palestinian culture is the avant garde of this new culture that is developing in our own time. Well, thank you very much.